Welcome to a profound journey of self-discovery and cosmic wisdom. In this video, we will explore all seven of the Hermetic Principles, drawing upon direct quotes from the book, The Kabbalion. I will also add in my own interpretations of these principles, as well as include practical application of these principles so you can be well on your way to leveraging these principles to your own advantage. But first, let's briefly discuss the origins of the Seven Hermetic Principles. The Seven Hermetic Principles today come from a book known as the Kabbalion. Published in 1908, the Kabbalion is a very interesting book in the sense of its origins. The published author of the Kabbalion is under the pseudonym Three Initiates, although further research of the book's origins is very loosely tied to William Walker Atkinson. I find this difficult to believe as it seems Atkinson was used as a sort of fall man for unknown authors of occult books from this time period. Regardless of the Kabbalion's publishing date and true author, the ancient wisdom contained within goes much further back to the ancient Greek and Egyptian gods of knowledge and wisdom, Hermes and Thoth, which are likely the same entity. To me, it is a significant thing that this knowledge has re-emerged in a time when it seems we need it the most. According to the book, this flame of truth has only been kept alive by the occult practitioners of its knowledge and it has been revealed to us again through an act of love. While other ancient bearers of this sacred truth keep it secret for their own power. When I listened to this book for the third time, it finally clicked for me. It was as if before the voice in my head was like, damn, my life is alright I guess, but it could be so much better, you know. I still have this longing for that thing or need this thing and I have so much to do and I know I'm not going to be able to do it all. To boom, I lack nothing. I am the one who decides my mental state by literally choosing my mental state. That's what it means to be a master. Imagine for a moment that life is like a big pool, the biggest, most extravagant pool in the world. Before I started studying these principles, it felt like I was stuck in one end of the pool. Definitely not the worst end of the pool, but I could see other people in other parts of the pool that looked better and more fun than where I was. I wanted to go there, but I didn't even know how to swim. All I could do is kick and bounce around wishing that I was in a different part of the pool. As we're now, by studying these principles, it's like I remembered how to swim and that I can go wherever I want to go in the pool. Number one, the principle of mentalism. The principle of mentalism is the first of the seven hermetic principles because it forms the bedrock upon which the others rest. The all is mine. The universe is mental, the Kabbalion. This principle embodies the truth that all is mind. It explains that the all, which is the substantial reality underlining all the outward manifestations and appearances which we know under the terms of the material universe, the phenomena of life, matter, energy, and in short all that is apparent to our material senses, is spirit which in itself is unknowable and undefinable, but which may be considered and thought of as an universal, infinite, living mind. It also explains that all the phenomena world or universe is simply a mental creation of the all, subject to the laws of created things, and that the universe as a whole, and in its parts or units, has its existence in the mind of the all, in which mind we live and move and have our being. Imagine for a moment that the universe isn't just the world outside of yourself. It's also your inner world, and also that you aren't just your inner world, you're also the universe. 
as above, so below, as within, so without. The first hermetic principle, the principle of mentalism, asserts that the universe is mental, the all is mind. What this means is that everything begins and has begun with the mind, with thoughts, and your imagination is the key to understanding and unlocking this universal truth. The collective has been brainwashed into believing the false teachings that thoughts come from the brain, which has evolved over millions of years and came after the physical universe. This is the opposite of the truth. Thought came first, and from thought came the universe. The Kabbalion teaches that this principle is foundational because it is through the mind, through imagination and thought, that we understand and apply the other six principles. Each principle builds upon the understanding that the universe is mental, and this realization allows us to unlock the secrets of vibration, polarity, rhythm, and more. In the first two foundational videos, Who slash What Are You and What Is Reality, we learn that they are essentially one in the same and that you are one with reality. This physical experience called life is essentially a temporary whirlpool in the vast ocean of consciousness. Everything is made of energy which is what you are at your core level of being, pure, raw, infinite energy. Think of this world as a blank canvas where thoughts, ideas, and emotions manifest as actions onto the physical world through you, the brush. Just as the painter creates art on a blank canvas from his imagination, you have the power to create your reality by using the power of your mind. Your imagination isn't just a fleeting daydream. It is a potent force of infinite potential that can manifest your desires into reality. The principle of mentalism urges us to recognize that our thoughts, when aligned with our desires, give birth to the action that shapes our lives. It's your imagination combined with action that brings your dreams into life, turning them into tangible experiences. Your imagination is the bridge between your inner world and the universe at large. By embracing the principle of mentalism, you become a conscious co-creator of your life's story. Becoming aware that the universe is mental is only the first step of self-mastery. A true master knows his mind is only as powerful as the gnosis he allows to come forth and harness from it. Most people's minds are like an uncontrollable wildfire jumping from one thing to the next until it is burnt up. The seven hermetic principles are essentially a lens to focus the infinite power of the mind, helping guide the light within the mind from a wildfire to a powerful narrowed beam of focused energy. 2. The Principle of Correspondence As above, so below, as below, so above, the Kabbalion. This principle embodies the truth that there is always a correspondence between the laws and phenomena of the various planes of life and being. The old hermetic axiom ran in these words, as above, so below, as below, so above. And the grasping of this principle gives one the means of solving many a dark paradox and hidden secrets of nature. There are planes beyond our knowing, but when we apply the principle of correspondence to them, we are able to understand much that would otherwise be unknowable to us. This principle is of universal application and manifestation on the various planes of the material, mental, and spiritual universe. It is a universal law. The ancient Hermetists considered this principle as one of the most important mental instruments by which man was able to pry aside obstacles which hid from view the unknown. 
Just as a knowledge of the principles of geometry enables man to measure distant suns and their movements while seated in his observatory, so a knowledge of the principle of correspondence enables man to reason intelligently from the known to the unknown. Studying the monad, he understands the archangel. <laughs> Everything. Whoa, bud, are you okay? Everything small is just a small version of something big. I understand everything. Finn the human. I like to think of the principle of correspondence as the fractal nature of reality. A monad is basically the most fundamental, indivisible, basic building block of something. So you could say that by studying the atom, we can understand the universe since atoms are essentially toroidal fields of energy that make up larger toroidal fields upon larger and larger toroidal fields. The statement, studying the monad, he understands the archangel, suggests that by deeply contemplating or understanding the fundamental and core principles of existence in this reality represented by the monad, a person can gain profound insights or understanding of higher and more complex planes of existence, symbolized here by the archangel. The hermetic axiom, as above, so below, essentially is stating the truth that the seven hermetic principles are operating on both higher and lower planes of existence, making the seven hermetic principles truly sacred. As within, so without. As without, so within. 3. The Principle of Vibration Nothing rests. Everything moves. Everything vibrates. The Kabbalion. This principle embodies the truth that everything is in motion. Everything vibrates. Nothing is at rest. Facts which modern science endorses and which each new scientific discovery tends to verify. And yet this hermetic principle was enunciated thousands of years ago by the masters of ancient Egypt. This principle explains that the differences between different manifestations of matter, energy, mind, and even spirit result largely from varying rates of vibration, from the all, which is pure spirit, down to the grossest form of matter, all is in vibration. The higher form of vibration, the higher the position in the scale. The vibration of spirit is at such an infinite rate of intensity and rapidity that it is practically at rest, just as a rapidly moving wheel seems to be motionless. And at the other end of the scale, there are gross forms of matter whose forms are so low as to seem at rest. Between these poles, there are millions upon millions of varying degrees of vibration from corpuscle to electron, atom and molecule, to worlds and universes, everything is in vibratory motion. This is also true on the planes of energy and force, which are but varying degrees of vibration, and also on the mental planes, whose states depend upon vibration, and even on to the spiritual planes. An understanding of this principle, with the appropriate formulas, enables hermetic students to control their own mental vibrations as well as those of others. The masters also apply this principle to the conquering of natural phenomena in various ways. He who understands the principle of vibration has grasped the scepter of power, says one of the old writers. The only thing I have to say about the principle of vibration is that by understanding this principle, you can understand what light truly is. Take a moment to ponder the fact that no one actually ever sees light itself. We only see the effects of light, illumination, usually caused by the release of high amounts of energy, i.e. the sun, fire, plasma, lightning, or electricity. All these things cause illumination, but what are you actually looking at when you're looking at these things? When you're looking at the source of light, you are literally seeing a portal to a higher plane of existence. 
one that is on another frequency band higher than our own. The energy in this dimension, where we are, is vibrating at very low frequencies. If you raise the frequency of that energy high enough, it will open a portal to the next dimension. Obviously, if you try to enter the portal, you will be destroyed because your body does not match that frequency band. But this is where you, spirit, energy, consciousness, comes from. So if you're able to comprehend what I just said, I hope I blew your mind. And if you didn't understand it, don't worry about it, because we're moving on to the principle of polarity. Four. The principle of polarity. Everything is dual. Everything has poles. Everything has its pair of opposites. Like and unlike are the same. Opposites are identical in nature, but different in degree. Extremes meet. All truths are but half-truths. All paradoxes may be reconciled. The Kabbalion. This principle embodies the truth that everything is dual, everything has two poles, everything has its pair of opposites, all of which were old hermetic axioms. It explains the old paradoxes that have perplexed so many which have been stated as follows. Thesis and antithesis are identical in nature but different in degree. Opposites are the same, differing only in degree. The pair of opposites may be reconciled extremes meet. Everything is and isn't at the same time. All truths are but half-truths. Every truth is half-false. There are two sides to everything, etc., etc. It explains that in everything there are two poles or opposite aspects, and that opposites are really only the two extremes of the same thing, with many varying degrees between them. To illustrate, heat and cold, although opposites, are really the same thing, the differences consisting merely of degrees of the same thing. Look at your thermometer and see if you can discover where heat terminates and cold begins. There is no such thing as absolute heat or absolute cold. The two terms heat and cold simply indicate varying degrees of the same thing and that same thing which manifests as heat and cold is merely a form, variety, and rate of vibration. So heat and cold are simply the two poles of that which we call heat, and the phenomena attended thereupon are manifestations of the principle of polarity. The same principle manifests in the case of light and darkness, which are the same thing the difference consisting of varying degrees between the two poles of the phenomena. Where does darkness leave off and light begin? What is the difference between large and small, between hard and soft, between black and white, between sharp and dull, between noise and quiet, between high and low, between positive and negative? The principle of polarity explains these paradoxes and no other principle can supersede it. The same principle operates on the mental plane. Let us take a radical and extreme example, that of love and hate. Two mental states apparently totally different and yet there are degrees of hate and degrees of love and a middle point in which we use the terms like or dislike that shade into each other so gradually that sometimes we are at a loss to know whether we like or dislike or neither. And all are simply degrees of the same thing, as you'll see if you will but think a moment. And more of this, and considered of more importance by the Hermetists, it is possible to change the vibrations of hate to the vibrations of love in one's own mind and the minds of others. Many of you who read these lines have had personal experiences of the involuntary rapid transition from love to hate, and the reverse in your own cases and that of others. And you will therefore realize the possibility of this being accomplished by the use of the will, by means of the hermetic formulas. Good and evil are but poles of the same thing. And the Hermetist understands the art of transmuting evil into good by means of an application of polarity. In short, the art of polarization becomes a phase of mental alchemy, 
known and practiced by the ancient and modern hermetic masters. An understanding of the principle will enable one to change his own polarity as well as that of others if he will devote the time and study necessary to master the art. It seems almost paradoxical yet divinely perfect to me that the principle of polarity is the fourth hermetic principle. Paradoxical because four is the middle point between one and seven. Perfect because the truth of mastering this principle lies within the fact of it being in the middle. And I'd like to quote a scripture from the Bible to bring this point home. I know thy works, that thou art neither cold nor hot. I would thou wert cold or hot. So then, because thou art lukewarm, and neither cold nor hot, I will spew thee out of my mouth. To me, this Bible verse is exposing the truth behind the duality of this world, and the technique used to ascend to higher worlds. The technique is that of the balancing of polarity, or attainment of neutrality. By being perfectly balanced between two poles, one is able to be both, yet neither, at the same time. Completely neutral, or being lukewarm, is the way of the master. It is from this neutral point that the master can venture into either pole he so chooses to. Duality has no place for neutrality or unity. Thus, being neutral, duality spits you out or simply has no need for you any longer and allows you to leave its confines. The heart chakra is the fourth chakra in the human vessel. When we center ourselves in our heart, we see that nothing is truly bad or good. Things just are, and allowing them to be is the ultimate act of love. When one listens to their heart, they operate from a place of unity and balance. They are simultaneously both poles of duality and yet neither one. Five, the principle of rhythm. Everything flows out and in. Everything has its tides. All things rise and fall. The pendulum swing manifests in everything. The measure of the swing to the right is the measure of the swing to the left. Rhythm compensates the Kabbalion. This principle embodies the truth that in everything there is manifested a measured to and fro, an outflow and inflow, a swing backward and forward, a pendulum-like movement a tide-like ebb and flow, a high tide and low tide between the two poles which exist in accordance with the principle of polarity described a moment ago. There is always an action and a reaction, an advance and a retreat, a rising and a sinking. This is in the affairs of the universe, suns, worlds, men, animals, mind, energy, and matter. This law manifests in the creation and destruction of worlds, in the rise and fall of nations, in the life of all things, and finally, in the mental states of man. And it is with this latter that the Hermeticists find the understanding of the principle most important. The Hermeticists have grasped this principle, finding its universal application and have also discovered certain means to overcome its effects in themselves by the use of the appropriate formulas and methods. They apply the mental law of neutralization. They cannot annul the principle or cause it to cease its operation, but they have learned how to escape its effects upon themselves to a certain degree depending upon the mastery of the principle. They have learned how to use it instead of being used by it. In this and similar methods consists the art of the hermetists. The master of hermetics polarizes himself at the point at which he desires to rest, 
and then neutralizes the rhythmic swing of the pendulum which would tend to carry him to the other pole. All individuals who have attained any degree of self-mastery do this to a certain degree more or less unconsciously, but the master does this consciously, and by the use of his will attains a degree of poise and mental firmness almost impossible of belief on the part of the masses who are swung back and forth like a pendulum. This principle and that of polarity have been closely studied by the Hermetics, and the methods of counteracting and neutralizing and using them form an important part of the Hermetic mental alchemy. So basically what this principle is saying is that everything has its rhythmic tides, including our emotions. The mental alchemy trick here is about polarizing yourself at the certain desired mental pole and neutralizing the pendulum swing back to the other pole by sheer force of will. A great example of this trick in action is the art of fasting. As you know, hunger comes in waves. You, as the master, have the ability to choose if you are going to give in to the hunger and eat, or by act of will, not eat, allowing the hunger to pass. You polarize yourself in the act of not eating, eventually neutralizing the hunger for the time being. Done properly, fasting has many health benefits and mental benefits, but always remember too much of anything can be harmful. It's all about finding balance. 6. The Principle of Cause and Effect Every cause has its effect. Every effect has its cause. Everything happens according to law. Chance is but a name for law not recognized. There are many planes of causation, but nothing escapes the law, the Kabbalion. This principle embodies the fact that there is a cause for every effect, an effect from every cause. It explains that everything happens according to law, that nothing ever merely happens, that there is no such thing as chance, that while there are various planes of cause and effect, the higher dominating the lower planes, still nothing ever escapes the law entirely. The Hermetists understand the art and methods of rising above the ordinary plane of cause and effect. To a certain degree, and by mentally rising to a higher plane, they become causers instead of effects. The masses of people are carried along obedient to the environment, the wills and desires of others stronger than themselves. Heredity, suggestion, and other outward causes moving them about like pawns on the chessboard of life. But the masters, rising to the plane above, dominate their moods, characters, qualities, and powers as well as the environment surrounding them, and they become movers instead of pawns. They help to play the game of life instead of being played and moved about by other wills and environment. They use the principle instead of being its tool. The masters obey the causation of the higher planes, but they help to rule on their own plane. In this statement, there is considered a wealth of hermetic knowledge. Let him read who can. This law is basically saying that there is nothing unaccounted for by the all. There is also nothing unaccounted for in a higher plane for that of a lower plane, yet there is nothing accounted for in a lower plane for that of a higher plane. Each plane of existence is bound to a frequency band of energy and belongs to the plane that is directly above it, all the way back to the infinitely highest frequency of the all. From the all, each plane down is a lower frequency projection of itself, a creation of a lower form of itself by its own will. Each effect's cause can be traced back all the way to the creation of emotion from the all itself. Try to keep the principle of cause and effect in the back of your mind when you go about your day. Doing so will help you become more aware of how your thoughts and actions are creating your current reality. 7. The Principle of Gender 
Gender is in everything. Everything has its masculine and feminine principles. Gender manifests on all planes, the Kabbalion. This principle embodies the truth that there is gender manifested in everything, the masculine and feminine principles ever at work. This is true not only of the physical plane, but also of the mental and even the spiritual planes. On the physical plane, the principle manifests as sex. On the higher planes, it takes higher forms, but the principle is ever the same. No creation, physical, mental, or spiritual, is possible without this principle. An understanding of its laws will throw light on many a subject that has perplexed the minds of men. The principle of gender works ever in the direction of generation, regeneration, and creation. Everything and every person contains the two elements or principles or this great principle within it, him or her. Every male thing has the female element also. Every female contains also the male principle. If you would understand the philosophy of mental and spiritual creation, generation, and regeneration, you must understand and study this hermetic principle. It contains the solution to many mysteries of life. Although we incarnate into this life into a physical body whose gender we cannot change, we most certainly carry both masculine and feminine attributes in our mind. The mind is dual, right? You have the right and left hemispheres of the brain, but it also goes deeper than that. On the mental plane, the principle of mental gender manifests itself as the I and the me identities of the mind. The I being masculine, and the me being feminine. The I is the static, acting and thinking part of the mind, and the me is the dynamic, feeling and responsive, feminine part of the mind. The I being literally you, and the me being how you think of yourself. The masculine part of the mind, I, is constantly trying to please the feminine part of the mind, me, through ideas and actions, and the feminine part of the mind is constantly giving its feedback to the masculine in real time via mental feedback. There's a constant conversation between these two aspects of you happening in your mind. It is important that the I does not let the me limit the I in its thinking and action because of fear. Doing so will result in an individual not taking action usually because the negative feedback from the me aspect of the mind talked the I out of doing something. A good example of this is not saying something you believe is true because you're afraid to. Remember, both these masculine and feminine characters are aspects of your own mind. However, this is just the brain. There is another aspect of the mind that is far more powerful than the brain the heart. While the brain in and of itself has both feminine and masculine aspects, the heart in and of itself is unique in that it is completely neutral, neither feminine nor masculine. The heart is not dual, it is one. Together, the heart and brain make up the mind of the human. And again, we see the principle of gender re-emerge. The brain being the masculine, thinking aspect of the mind, and the heart being the feminine, feeling part of the mind. A harmonious experience is attained when the two are united through heart-brain coherence when the thoughts and actions carried out by the brain are in alignment with the feelings in the heart. It is only when you quiet the brain that you will hear the heart speak. Always listen to your heart. It is impossible to truly know the all in its nature, and I do not claim to know the infinite all as it is unfathomable. If it were possible to look at the all from outside the all, one would only see a masculine presence of static thought and static being, a masculine energy appearing to be still. Remember, something viewed from the outside that is in such a high rate of vibration may appear to be still. However, once we go within this static thought energy field, 
we find that it is far from still, and there is another element of itself that was previously unseen to us from outside looking in. Emotion, or energy in motion. It is from these two energies, the masculine and feminine aspects of spirit, that all other forms of energy are born. Below are several hermetic axioms from the Kabbalion. Study them, use them, and make them your own, for they are not your own until you have used them. Number one, to change your mood or mental state, change your vibration. One may change his mental vibrations by an effort of will in the direction of deliberately fixing the attention upon a more desired state of mind. Will directs the attention, and attention changes the vibration. Cultivate the art of attention by means of the will, and you have solved the secret of the mastery of moods and mental states. Number two, to destroy an undesirable rate of mental vibration, put into operation the principle of polarity and concentrate upon the opposite pole to that which you desire to suppress. Kill out the undesirable by changing its polarity. Don't dwell on the fear. Cultivate courage. If you are possessed by fear, do not waste time trying to kill out the fear. Do not focus on killing fear. By doing so, you are giving the fear your attention, in which it simply continues to grow. Instead, focus on cultivating courage and the fear will simply disappear. In a dark room, you do not have to shovel out or sweep out the darkness. There is nothing you can do with the darkness that will make it go away. However, by simply opening the shades to let in light, the darkness is gone. Remember that there never was any darkness to begin with, only an absence of light. To kill out a negative quality, concentrate upon the positive pole of that same quality. Number three, rhythm may be neutralized by applying the art of polarization. As we have explained in previous chapters, the Hermetists hold that the principle of rhythm manifests on the mental plane as well as on the physical plane, and that the bewildering succession of moods, feelings, emotions, and other mental states are due to the backward and forward swing of the mental pendulum, which carries us from one extreme feeling to another. The Hermetists also teach that the law of neutralization enables one to a great extent to overcome the operation of rhythm in consciousness. As we have explained, there is a higher plane of consciousness as well as the ordinary lower plane, and the master, by rising mentally to the higher plane, causes the swing of the mental pendulum to manifest on the lower plane, and he, dwelling on his higher plane, escapes the consciousness of the swing backward. This is achieved by polarizing on the higher self, and thus raising the mental vibrations of the ego above those of the ordinary plane of consciousness. It is akin to rising above a thing and allowing it to pass beneath you. The advanced Hermetist polarizes himself at the positive pole of his being, the I am pole, rather than the pole of personality, and by refusing and denying the operation of rhythm, raises himself above its plane of consciousness, and standing firm in his statement of being, he allows the pendulum to swing back on the lower plane without changing his polarity. This is accomplished by all individuals who have attained any degree of self-mastery whether they understand the law or not. Such persons simply refuse to allow themselves to be swung back by the pendulum of mood and emotion, and by steadfastly affirming the superiority, they remain polarized on the positive pole. The master, of course, attains a far greater degree of proficiency because he understands the law which he has overcome 
by a higher law, and by the use of his will, he attains a degree of poise and mental steadfast, almost impossible of belief on the part of those who allow themselves to be swung backward and forward by the mental pendulum of moods and feelings. Remember always, however, that you do not really destroy the principle of rhythm, for that is indestructible. You simply overcome one law by counterbalancing it with another, and thus maintain an equilibrium. The laws of balance and counterbalance are in operation on the mental and as well on the physical planes. An understanding of these laws enables one to seem that he is overthrowing laws when he is merely exerting a counterbalance. Number four. Nothing escapes the principle of cause and effect, but there are many planes of causation, and one may use the laws of the higher to overcome the laws of the lower. By an understanding of the practice of polarization, the Hermetists rise to a higher plane of causation, and thus counterbalance the laws of the lower planes of causation. By rising above the plane of ordinary causes, they become themselves in a degree causes instead of being merely caused. By being able to master their own moods and feelings, and by being able to neutralize rhythm, as we have already explained, they are able to escape a great part of the operations of cause and effect on the ordinary plane. The masses of people are carried along obedient to their environment. The wills and the desires of others stronger than themselves, the effects of inherited tendencies, the suggestions of those about them, and the other outward causes which tend to move them about the chessboard of life like mere pawns. By rising above these influencing causes, the advanced hermetists seek a higher plane of mental action, and by dominating their moods, emotions, impulses and feelings, they create for themselves new characters, qualities and powers by which they overcome their ordinary environment and thus become practically players instead of mere pawns. Such people help to play the game of life understandingly instead of being moved about this way and that by stronger influences and powers and wills. They use the principle of cause and effect instead of being used by it. Of course, even the highest are subject to the principle as it manifests on the higher planes, but on the lower planes of activity, they are masters instead of slaves. As the Kabbalion says, the wise ones serve on the higher, but rule on the lower. They obey the laws coming from above them, but on their own plane and those below them, they rule and give orders, and yet in doing, they form a part of the principle instead of opposing it. The wise man falls in with the law, and by understanding its movements, he operates it instead of being its blind slave. Just as does the skilled swimmer turn this way and that way, going and coming as he will, instead of being as the log, which is carried here and there, so is the wise man as compared to the ordinary man. And yet both the swimmer and the log, wise men and fool, are subject to law. He who understands this is well on the road to mastery. Number five, true hermetic transmutation is a mental art. The Hermetists teach that the great work of influencing one's environment is accomplished by mental power. The universe being wholly mental, it follows that it may be ruled only by mentality, and in this truth it is to be found an explanation of all the phenomena and manifestations of the various mental powers which are attracting so much attention and study in these earlier years of the 20th century. If the universe be mental in its substantial nature, then it follows that mental transmutation must change the conditions and phenomena of the universe. If the universe is mental, then the mind must be the highest power affecting its phenomena. If this be understood, then all the so-called miracles and wonder workings are seen plainly for what they are. The all is mind. The universe is mental. The Kabbalion. 8. The Principle of Mastery 
The eighth law is one of my own creation. It is the law of mastery. It states that all seven laws are but one law, which I call the law of mastery. The eighth law of mastery is that of the master, that by understanding and applying all seven laws, one has become the master of their reality, thus reaching one end of polarity in the spectrum of consciousness of that plane. The opposite end of the pole of mastery being that of the fool. The master understands that all seven hermetic laws are of but one unified law, the law of mastery and that the master applies these laws effectively to create his or her desired reality. The master knows it's all in his or her mind. Therefore, even when it may not seem so, choice is always available. The master also knows that for every choice there is a known and unknown consequence, a cause and effect, a known reality and a hidden reality. As above, so below. The master honors both the divine masculine and feminine aspects within themselves by first feeling with their heart, then thinking with the brain. The master sets his or her being, the I am, at the vibrational frequency of the reality they wish to attract and polarizes themselves at that frequency. The master takes the necessary actions to remain polarized at that vibration of being. By sheer force of will combined with the art of neutralization and the art of polarization, the master is able to overcome the rhythmic swings of the emotional pendulum and remain polarized at their I am polarity. Any and all interferences with the master's frequency is simply an opportunity to transmutate. Transmutation is done by first feeling with the heart, then thinking with the brain. The master understands that by properly leveraging these principles, they have no unknown consequence to fear, only unexpected surprises to celebrate. What makes this experience called life so worthwhile is the exciting surprise in the degree or magnitude of said unknown consequences. Ask yourself what the effect on your life would be if you made the choice to become the master of your reality. Thank you for watching. I sincerely hope you found value in this video and that it helps you on your journey of self-mastery. I highly recommend that you read or listen to the full book, The Kabbalion, and I'll include a link to the audiobook in the description of this video. This video took a lot of time and effort to create, and I'd really appreciate it if you would leave a like and subscribe to my channel for more self-mastery content. I wish love and abundance for each of you, and until next time, master your reality.